Feeding your friends, data scientist, analyst, bioinformatics, epidemiologist, and data-oriented audience all together. And I am going to start off by reading you an excerpt from a research article, and you tell me what it relates to. Are you ready? This one's kind of interesting. Here we go. Additionally, school children being tested for the virus, right here, just in case you can't see, surreptitiously adding fruit juice and other contaminants into the test device to cause false positives in order to gain time off from school. And if you guessed it, which I guess many of you have, you are right. Avoiding false positives for SARS-CoV-2 when using rapid antigen tests. And yes, our students are very bright and found ways to cause false positives with the tests in order to get time off from the school. And of course, that creates a whole other problem on the side. But as far as the kids are concerned, hey, Time off from a school is time off from a school. All right, that's a brief bite or look into what we'll be looking at tonight as well. All right, here's another little uh, tidbit of information. Let's see, you can see what it's related to. Let's begin over patient trajectory here, if, I guess a Norwegian study. All right, I'm just going to show you a real brief part right here. Let's say uh, unvaccinated right here. If you read this top part here, vaccination status, unvaccinated. Admission to ICU, 83%. I'm just going to read the percentages. Now, keep in mind, this group is kind of small at the time, so it may not be able to rise to a level of statistical significance, but still just the same. It's worthy of note. 83% of the unvaccinated uh, did not get admitted to ICU, where 17% of the unvaccinated did. In the case of the fully vaccinated, 80% did not go to the ICU, where 20% did. Mortality in the hospital. 98% of the unvaccinated did not die in the hospital. 2% unfortunately did. Fully vaccinated, 87.5% did not die in the hospital. 12.5% did. Now keep in mind, it, I'm not going to add publisher bias. I'm just showing you the raw data as it is. Uh, there may be some statistical analysis which could change the leaning of these numbers, but still just the same. Uh, that is the data, and we'll cover this data as well. Uh, in two patient trajectories among the hospitalized COVID-19 patients vaccinated with mRNA vaccine in Norway, a registered-based cohort study. And also, too, as well, we will cover, uh, which is a biggie, which I am surprised not gaining traction in the media, is the British Medical Journal uh, investigation. The COVID-19 researcher blows the whistle on data integrity issues in Pfizer vaccine trial. Now, what disturbed me most about Ventivia uh, in this falsified data claim, I want to use the word alleged, was this part. When after repeatedly notifying Ventivia of these problems, the regional director, Brooke Jackson, emailed the complaint to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, the regional director, regional director, complaint to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Ventivia, Ventivia fired her later that same day. Now, I want you to dwell on this. I don't know what the dynamic was as far as submitting a report to the FDA and then being fired that exact same day, whether Vantavia was aware that she was submitting a report or basically if someone at the FDA contacted Vantavia in reference to the report and they fired the whistleblower. Uh, again, we're going to look at this a little bit later on because uh, I want to cover the positive stuff in reference to uh, helping individuals as opposed to the um, more disturbing elements that may be behind the scenes. Again, let us begin. Also, too, let's start with our disclaimer. Uh, let's look at the articles we're going to cover tonight first. Almost forgot. Here we go. All the articles as follows. Formulation of composite nasal spray enabling enhanced surface coverage and prophylaxis of sars COV-2, pretty cool stuff. And we'll get to that in a little bit. All right. Then, can ancient botanical therapies help treat COVID-19? And this is a reference to a, a mushroom formulation that they're working on, which is actually kind of exciting as well. Another article, another article. And it doesn't say what it is at the top, but we know it's heparin. Anticoagulant has beneficial side effects for COVID-19 patients. It's kind of a weird way of uh, interjecting it into the research, side effects. But uh, it's 
pretty amazing. Heparin is coming out to be a stellar when it, remember we did a few weeks ago, has to be administered properly. In the case of the study we looked at a couple of weeks ago, it had to be through injection. So don't jump the gun yet until more information is actually um, uh, brought to light. All right, then we'll be looking at this, the uh, British Medical Journal investigation into the whistle researcher whistleblower. Now keep in mind, the whistleblower itself did not just say things. The whistleblower allegedly has information as far as recordings, pictures, so on and so forth down the line. Uh, so it's just not some like we're so familiar with an anonymous source or this source or that source or someone writes a book. No, this is supposedly they have tangible evidence in reference to their claim, alleged claims. Alleged, I'm going to use the word alleged until more information is um, available. Uh, next, after that, patient trajectory and hospitalized COVID-19 patients vaccinated with mRNA vaccine in Norway registered. It actually speaks highly of the vaccine. Uh, but at the same time, too, the raw data, uh, which is basically in the study itself, enables you to add a different dimension, maybe not the one intended by the researchers in reference to the outcome, but the raw data itself is of immense value. All right, after that, immunity to COVID-19 in India through vaccination and natural infection. All right, if it's, you know I'm posting it here and we are partaking in a little bit of selection bias. For those now familiar, selection bias is where you're cherry picking your articles in order to validate an argument. Uh, but again, however, though, this is now a drum beat that is picking up in rhythm. So it turns out that this was probably the right uh, road, route to take. Immunity to COVID-19 in India through vaccination, natural infection. We'll get to which one is better in a little bit. Avoiding false positives. If it wasn't such a serious event and so many lives were locked down and schools were shut down and so on and so forth, I could find this to be probably the most amusing article of levity during the entire pandemic. However, though, you want to find out how easy it is to basically yield a false positive. If the test being utilized is not being used in the parameters of the manufacturer's request, and it has to do with buffering agents, and it's not just fruit juice, uh, you'll find out all the things that can cause those false positives, or at least the ones that the school children have already found. To be next after that, new study finds evidence of COVID-19 antibodies in breast milk and vaccinated mothers. The reason this article is because it's another drumbeat that is basically picking up in steam is there is different immunity elicited from natural infection and basically um, vaccination. We looked at an article a little while ago when they found out that the unvaccinated will tend to hold the virus in the nasal cavity, where the vaccinated, there'll be virtually no virus in the nasal cavity when doing it like a test per se. It's mostly in the saliva. So that's why if you've seen a lot of places go into saliva testing, that is the, one of the reasons why, because the unvaccinated and the vaccinated shed the virus, it appears, until more data is to solidify it, in different areas. So you see that dichotomy when you have that split, that divide, something's different. Don't know exactly what it is yet, but it's beginning to show itself. And we'll look at this one in a second too. Association of self-reported COVID-19 infection. Let's get this one out of the way real fast. This is not to be moaning. What the researchers are trying to say is a lot of people which are making the claim of long COVID. And it was interesting if you actually delve deep into the research. A lot of people uh, were, were saying they were positive because they believe they had it and therefore were reporting on long COVID. But they're not saying that the people aren't feeling these symptoms of fatigue and something, something, something or something else. What the researchers are trying to imply through the Journal of American Medical Association in this research article that took place in France, was that that it's too easy to diagnose it as long COVID now, since that has a strong uh, confounding factor in the environment and since it is the pandemic of the day, when it may actually be something else. 
potentially even more serious. But however, though, it's being diagnosed as long COVID when it could be something like, let's say, chronic fatigue, Epstein-Barr, who knows. But to read the article right off the bat, and we'll just get this one out of the way, the re results of the study that included nearly 27,000 individuals in France suggest that physical symptoms such as fatigue, breathlessness, or impaired attention persisting 10 to 12 months after the first wave of the pandemic may be associated more with the belief, remember that they're not trying to belittle anyone with how they feel. They're just saying it's too easy to default to long COVID because it's popular. Belief in having been infected with SARS-CoV-2 CoV than having laboratory confirmed COVID-19. A lot of individuals that claimed they had COVID-19, according to the study, and were claimed to have long COVID, never really had laboratory confirmed SARS-CoV-2. All right, so let's get this one out of the way right off the bat. And then another highlight, uh, I'm really into the basically, you know, there's an old saying, you know, a person's true character is how they act when no one's looking. Uh, and when, when you see those breaches in trust, it begins to uh, navigate or basically create curiosity in other things. Well, if they were not honest about that, then what else were they not honest about? And you have the domino effect. This one is from uh, the British Medical Journal as well. Moderna seeks to exclude the U.S. government scientists from vaccine patents despite public investment. And before we get into that, I'm just going to tell you exactly right off the bat the title, and we'll come back to it a little bit. The National Institute of Health gave Moderna $1.4 billion to develop the vaccine and lent the company its scientists and facilities. So the NIH, out of all the multitude of investments, gave $1.4 billion to Moderna, as well as the scientists and the facilities. Announcing its application for emergency authorization last year, the current U.S. Chief Medical Advisor, Anthony Fauci, called it the NIH Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. Well, Moderna obviously had different motivations and when they thought these patents were going to, or at least credit was going to go to some of the scientists from the U.S. government who actually pioneered the mRNA vaccine, Moderna mm, doesn't appear like they were a, they're playing on the same field. What do you see their excuse? All right, and then of course, here's the disclaimers. Before we go into VARES data, uh, the VARES database. While very important to monitoring vaccine safety, VARES reports cannot alone be used to determine vaccine cause or contributed to adverse event or illness. The reports may contain that information that is incomplete, inaccurate, coincidental, or unverifiable. So again, reports, the reports to VARES, not reports coming from VARES. Important distinction. Uh, especially in reference to correlation and causation. Uh, European database, same disclaimer as the VAERS, but we use in a vigilance. Uh, vigilance. Uh, GIS aid, again, for the, um, the variants, even though now it appears to be all Delta, but we have now have Delta II, uh, but I haven't seen the data arise yet to distinguish between Delta and the sublineages of Delta so far. And then, of course, my beloved, our world and data. Incredible, incredible data source. So now let us begin with the research as follows. First one we start with is, oh, by the way, too, if you want to see, just before we go, for the data analysts out there, how's Florida doing? Remember Florida was falling apart, no vaccine mandate, so on and so forth. And come on here, let's move this up. Da, 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 da. Where am I? Come on, there it is. Let's see how it's doing. Not that this is something we keep score because we're talking a very serious subject, but mortality. Florida now, as of November 11th, is 0.153 new deaths per 100,000 smooth. California, 1.33. So that's close to what he'd say, nine times. California has a nine times higher mortality rate. And for those who are not familiar, obviously being November 13th, now at 11.49 p.m., Two days ago, Newsom decided to extend the state of emergency in California to March 2022 so he could do more things, which obviously, from an observational standpoint, do not appear to be working. So Florida, there we are. California, New York. So Florida is now doing better than two other states, which uh, are great practitioners 
of pandemic lockdowns and states of emergencies and vaccine mandates, which is ironic because the state which is fighting all of them now has the best rating of mortality per 100,000 smooth. Texas still has a little bit of time to go, but however, though, as we look at this real fast, let's go back. You'll notice a distinct pattern. All right, if we look at it like an algorithm, what do you think? It's two months, two months, two months, two months. Every time this appears to be a spike, they seem to be pretty solid on their time. At this current rate, as New York and California are rising, uh, what do you think? Two weeks before Texas is below California, New York? We'll see. I'll keep the videos going until the time, time so we actually find out. But now to proceed as follows. A formulation of composite nasal spray enabling enhanced surface coverage and prophylactics of SARS-CoV-2. Going to read the highlights for those not familiar. Now, carrageenan. This is why I'm bringing it up. For those not familiar with carrageenan, let's, let's, let's remind you. Carrageenan from red edible seaweed, otherwise Irish moss. And the form they use before I proceed further down the study is lambda. So lambda does not gel and it's used for it's thickening to like, for example, to use or to, as a thickened to dairy products. I'm not a chef, maybe uh, some of you out there are, but I'd be curious uh, to the applications which are used more in the food world. But the objective for the really here is not for them to make a profit. And they, they give an example of what they use. But however, though, at the same time too, we're just reporting on a research article. We're not making a recommendation uh, for anybody else to do their own stuff. But to begin, they made a composite mixture using both gelin and carrageenan. Furthermore, the spray, which is a nasal spray, uh, systems demonstrate highly potent capacities to prevent SARS-CoV-2 infection in viral cells, resulting in complete inhibition when either treating the cells or the virus prior to challenging for infection. From this data, a mechanism for both prophylactics, prophylactics, prophylaxis, and prevention is proposed, where entrapment within polymeric coating sterically blocks virus sterically 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 blocks virus uptake into the cells, inactivating the virus and allowing clearest clearance within the vicious medium, vicious, <laughs> oh gosh, I can't pronounce it, viscose medium, and such a fully vicious, it's very vicious, this viscous, viscous, viscous medium, and such a fully preventative spray form is formulated targeted at protecting the lining of the upper respiratory pathways against SARS-CoV-2. That's a pretty amazing discovery. And the interesting part about it is, and the reason I'm looking at the full study is as opposed to just the press release, the public release, is because it gives more impact on how effective it was, at least in a lab setting. But at the same time, too, you got to recognize the objective of the researchers is to make a very inexpensive uh, prophylaxis, prophylaxis that can be utilized uh, in individuals across the board, vaccinated and unvaccinated, so on and so forth. And it's so beautifully simple in its in its production well let me not let us not um delineate here we go da, 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 da. let's go down to the bottom wonderful studies again uh those familiar with youtube i will have the the links on the uh, youtube uh, description so you can follow on your own so again i only have we only have like an hour so i can take the highlights and trust me we can eat up an hour in a heartbeat but here it goes because i love to read the whole thing but again, lambda, lambda carrageenan. All right, conclusion. The study has demonstrated the formulation of potent antiviral nasal spray with not only prophylactic capacity, but the ability to prevent viral transmission. Its ability to completely inhibit infection is derived from the chemistry, the sulfate of polymer backbone of the active polymer, lambda carrageenan. All right, so it goes into how they made the spray uh, to get the viscosity. Vicious, vicious, the viciousness, this, uh, in reference to basically how to utilize it. It's so incredibly simple and so, but very, very incredibly powerful. As such, this work presents a potential device with the capacity to specifically target the infection within the nasal cavity. 
But here it is right here. It gives you, they're very open about everything that's utilized and so on and so forth. Uh, and so it gives you an idea of really how incredibly simple uh, a, a preparation this actually is. And if it be that effectively in a lab setting, if that carries out to animal and human trials, it would be just amazing. And again, one of the op uh, objectives here was for them to produce something which is very inexpensive that could be used globally. In this case, if it works in human trials, like it works in a lab, wow, it, that, that'd be just amazing. But again, I'll have the links for you at all time. The links will be there under the YouTube description. After that, this one, can ancient botanical therapies help treat COVID-19? This is a study, which is, I believe already, uh, they've been doing for quite some time. I regret they can't speed it up, but it's in progress. And it looks like it's holding promise. That's probably why they're doing the public release article. Uh, per se, right here. Can they say business announcement? See what I mean? A novel study is assessing whether medicinal mushrooms and Chinese herbs provide a therapeutic benefit, benefit in treating acute COVID-19 infection, the Mach 19, or I like the, the title, which means mushrooms and Chinese herbs for COVID-19. But you can easily remember Mach 19. All right, to proceed. The mushroom-based product for COVID-19, which started December 2020 and is slated to run until December 2022, tests the safety and feasibility, you know, like your phase one trials and so on and so forth, of a 50-50 blend of mushrooms, agaricum, and turkey tail, capsule form. Everything is right there. They just told you exactly what it is. And again, they're being in the phase one clinical safety trials to make sure obviously tolerability and so on and so forth. And, you know, don't try this at home type disclaimer, but per se, it's like a Garagon and Turkey Tail, which began in July 2021 is projected to conclude in December 2022, which is probably at the exact same time the vaccine trials will probably end uh, to test the phase of safety and feasibility of the formulation of 21 Chinese herbs from Taiwan called uh now I can't pronounce that. Fei Pai Du King Fei I please someone pronounce it correctly for me. The only reason I'm not going to pronounce it is because I don't want to be disrespectful by mispronouncing it and probably saying something else. But there it is. Why they use a COVID-19 remedy in China? Now that's kind of interesting. I'm thinking about that. If this is already being widely used as a COVID-19 remedy in China. And I, I'm, I'm curious because there has to be some, I mean, some sort of track record of its uh, use or studies or detailed. So if anybody else has any detailed in reference to that, I would love to see that. But I don't want to add publisher bias or add more dimensions to the article, research article, than it already exists. But there's the mushrooms, the 50-50 blend, and the Chinese herbal, herbal, herbal for COVID-19. Uh, which I'd be quite curious if anybody has any more data on it. Oh, I'll actually look for it myself too as well. Then of course, according to Sachs, I believe, the mushrooms were chosen because of a long history of use and recent evidence of immune enhancing and antiviral effects. In a preclinical study published in the March 2019 issue of Mycology, agaricon was found to inhibit viruses, including influenza, uh, H1N1, a H a H5N1, influenza A, and herpes. Now that's going to open up a whole other ball of wax. So basically there you are. He said he believes the medicinal mushrooms inhibit the virus's replication and theory plans to test against SARS-CoV-2 in a phase two trials. So keep in mind, more to come. It says vaccines lead to the production of antibodies that can, can destroy the viruses in the blood. According to the researcher, mushrooms may not only increase the number of these antibodies, but also enhance T cell immunity against virally infected cells. Further, because mushrooms bind to receptors on human immune cells, they can modulate our immunity, boosting it in some ways and calming it down in others. And this property of mushrooms may also reduce vaccine-related side effects. That is really cool. And it goes into the history, so on and so forth. I reference to the botanical data. And again, I'll have the links for you as well. The Mach 19 trial. And I want to highlight a little interest in reference to this right here. I, 
So when we come back, I don't forget it, or you can highlight it on your own. So basically, it's something for us to look into a little bit later on. I'd like to know, I think it's Fei Pao Do. I don't know. If someone can pronounce it for me, I greatly, greatly appreciate it. I don't want to be disrespectful in that light. But to proceed for, further forward, all right, anticoagulant. Now, this one, how many studies have we come up with heparin? Just comes up every single week now. Again, last week, it was the best way to administer it. But let me just read through it and read the, the outcome of what the uh, medical university, I would say about medicinal university, medical university of Vienna came out with. Clotting problems and resulting complications are co common in COVID-19 patients. Researchers at the medical university of Vienna have now shown that a member of the anticoagulant group of drugs not only has a beneficial effect on survival of COVID-19 patients, but also influences the duration of active infection with the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. The results were recently published in the Journal of Cardiovascular Research. Now, I don't know why it is like so far down the article, but you have to go all the way down, da 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 and there, boom, there it pops up. Low molecular weight heparin curtails duration of infection. The analysis showed, however, that the period of active SARS-CoV-2 infection is curtailed in patients treated with low molecular weight heparin. The most commonly used anticoagulant. Remember where heparin uh, comes from? It also was originally found from another seaweed. Uh, Fucoxanthin? Fucoxanthin, I believe. The most commonly used anticoagulant. In patients who receive this drug, infection time is an average of four days shorter than in patients who are not treated with low molecular weight heparin. We were surprised to see that low molecular weight heparin may have a direct effect on coronavirus and its inf infectivity. According to the researcher, experimental data, let's bring that up a little bit. Experimental data showed that heparin can inhibit the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to bind to cells, thereby preventing them from being infected. I mean, we have such an incredible arsenal of promising uh, you know, tools against the coronavirus now that um, I'm still kind of, you know, you know perplexed at the uh, level of severity is still infecting a large sections of our po global population. Because again, from UV lights to ozone to, you know, from nitric oxide to heparin, for example, to so on and so forth, uh, we can go down the line. It's, it's like, We've, every week there's been a breakthrough, but it's just getting it into, you know, into where it needs to go, so to say. Next, after that, this one we're going to go with now. That's our beneficial stuff. So we had heparin. We had basically the Mach 19, the mushroom combination with uh, this. And we had carrageenan. And uh, with, uh, was it gelin? Gelin? Yeah, in order for, to help it basically emulsify fast. And it was lambda carrageenan, so it was basically the, the one used for dairy products and so on and so forth. Yeah, gelin, gelin, gelin. All right, so proceed. Now we get into the, some of the serious stuff. Again, now I'm not, the only reason I'm bringing this up, and I don't like bringing, going into the negative aspect, but the level of trust which the populations of this planet have needs to be placed in an arena where the credibility, where the integrity is unquestionable because it's a lot to ask of people to basically, you know, to give up some of their inalienable rights in order to benefit others, but yet the people manufacturing such elements uh, yeah, allegedly could have questions arise. Does that make any sense? Well, let us... There's good people in every company. And, you know, sometimes there's not necessarily the best leadership, which creates problems. Just like, for example, in this aspect here, the company, which is in question with a uh, relationship with Pfizer, there were good people inside the company that came forward. They just happened to be terminated. But to proceed, there we go. But for the research, here we are. You know, the title of the article, Researchers Blow the Whistle on Data Integrity Issues in the Pfizer's Vaccine Trial. Uh, you could read the responses and related uh, re related content, and you're going to get the same thing. Why did this not pick up more traction since this affects almost everybody on the globe? November 2nd, 2021. 
But for researchers who were testing Pfizer's vaccine at several sites in Texas during that autumn, speed may have come at a cost of data integrity. So not just talk of one site. I watched the news broadcast trying to uh, berate this research article saying it was a single site. And that's not the case at all. But that's not the first time the news or articles come out with that in reference to basically projection that may not be accurate. During the autumn, speed may have come at a cost of data integrity and patient safety. A regional director was employed at the research organization of Antavia Research Group has told, quote, the British Medical Journal, that the company, quote unquote, and remember, you have to say everything here allegedly, falsified data, unblinded patients, employed inadequately trained vaccinators, and was slow to follow up on adverse events reported in the Pfizer's pivotal phase three trial. Staff who conducted quality control checks were overwhelmed by the volume of problems they were finding. After repeatedly notifying Vantavia of these problems, the regional director, Brooke Jackson, emailed a complaint to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Vantavia fired her later that same day. The exact same day. You see where you're trying to get the correlation there? Did she tell them she was going to submit the report and they did that in response? Or did someone from the FDA contact Ventavia and said, hey, you have a troublemaker in your ranks? I don't know. Be curious to find out. Jackson has provided the British Medical Journal with dozens of internal company documents, photos, audio recordings, and emails. Now, for me personally, until there was an opportunity to publicly have purview of those internal company documents, photos, audio recordings, and emails, um, yeah, it's going to, chances are, this is not going to reduce hesitancy in vaccine uptake, but obviously this will obviously on have the inverse, increase hesitancy in reference to vaccine uptake. Now, when you're considering with children now being mandated and so on and so forth, and this information came forward, I believe, right before the FDA approved it. Yeah, I got a lot of red flags. I got, I, I, that raised a lot of red flags. But to proceed. Another showed vaccine packaging materials. This is the videos and so on. So with trial participants, identification numbers written on them, left out in the open, unblinding, potentially unblinding patients. You can read through the whole thing there, so on and so forth. The expectation for the study is that all queries are addressed within 24 hours. All right, let me start with the topic sentence. Ventavia was not keeping up with data entry queries. So it sounds like they just got overwhelmed, just overwhelmed. Doesn't mean that it's necessarily intentionally doing anything. It just sounds like chaos ensued. Showed an email sent by ICON, the contract research organization with which Pfizer partnered on the trial. ICON reminded Ventivia on September 2020 email, quote, the expectation for this study is that all queries are addressed within 24 hours. ICON then highlighted over 100 outstanding queries older than three days in yellow. See, there, there's individuals trying to keep an eye on each other, but something broke. And I'm speaking in the best possible light. Examples included two individuals for which subject has, quote, reported severe symptoms, reactions per protocol. Subjects experiencing grade three local reactions should be contacted. Please confirm if an unplanned contact was made, an update in course, meaning the individuals were having reactions and they just, let it go. According to the trial protocol, a telephone contact should have occurred to ascertain further details and determine whether a site visit is clinically indicated. So if people are having severe reactions and then no one's contacted them back. So there's the issue. And you can see, for example, this article here, right here <laughs> has been, what is it right here? It's been on 17 Facebook pages, but it's tweeting is quite popular. 89 news outlets, four Wikipedia pages, 72 and 18 videos. Now we'll make it 19. All right, to keep on proceeding. The next morning, September 25th, 2020, 2020, Jackson called the FDA to warn about unsound practices in Pfizer's clinical trial at Ventavia. She then reported her concerns in the email to the agency. And that afternoon, Ventavia fired Jackson, deemed not a good fit according to her separation letter. Jackson told the British Medical Journal it was the first time she'd been fired in a 20-year career in research. All of that is there, and let's proceed to the bottom here. 
Now this is other other employees now are echoing the same thing. But however though, I'm not I'm not a fan of anonymity anonymity. Uh, two former Ventavi employees spoke to British Medical Journal anonymously for fear of reprisal and loss of job prospects in the tightly knit research community. And I guarantee that's a big thing. You come out today, I mean, just think of it in a Boolean sense. If you want a job in the medical industry, would you get a job if you questioned, let's say, for example, vaccine efficacy or vaccine study? Or would you get a job if you just said, hey, that study was great. Best thing ever. Let's go along with it. You, you don't have to be a genius to figure out which one, act, which statement or which path would actually increase your job prospects, at least in the near term. In the future, that may change. But to proceed, two former Ventavi employees, blah, 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 both confirmed broad aspects of Jackson's complaints. One said that she had worked on over four dozen clinical trials in her career, including many large trials, but never had experienced such a helter-skelter work environment as with Ventavia, Ventavia on Pfizer's trial. Quote, I have never had to do what they were asking me to do. It just seemed like something a little different from normal. The things were allowed and expected. She added that during her time at Ventavia, the company expected a federal audit, but it never came. After Jackson left the company, problems persisted at Ventavia. The employees said in several cases, Ventavia lacked enough employees to swab all trial participants who reported COVID-like symptoms to test for infection. Laboratory confirmed symptomatic COVID-19 was the trial's primary endpoint, the employee noted. And it goes into the review and so, so, so on and so forth. And this is the part that disturbs me the most. I don't think it was good, clean data. Uh, the employees said of the data Ventavia generated for the Pfizer trial, it's a crazy mess. And before I conclude with that, why I think that's important, and just to show you a little bit of data, if we look at this data right here, right? Let's make this a little smaller. So we get to the end point there. It may bounce around a little bit. I guess not. Let's make it this way. There, let's see. And I want to show you this graph. This is what makes me wonder a lot. So we look at this chart. Now, we saw this chart right here, and this is new deaths per 100,000. This is May 2020. So looking about April 16th, 2.85 mortality per 100,000. And I'm a big person when it comes to observation. I know there's a lot of confounding factors and correlations, not, not cor uh, you know, correlations, not causation. But with the mass number of individuals being inoculated, I would have expected from May all the way to this time here, November 11th, 2.65. And a few days ago, while we were at, you know, down that line, I would expect it to have not to be at close to the exact same starting point in mortality per 100,000 as we were from the beginning. So something is really, to me, amiss. You see what I mean? If I expected if the vaccine inoculation campaigns were working in, you know, you know, in combination with natural infection, I would assume in July when we hit here, we would not have had a rise. But from an observational standpoint, and purely from an observational standpoint, wouldn't you expect the mortality per 100,000 to be less than it was at the very beginning with all the advances in medical technology, treatments, and so on and so forth? I would expect it better, but I'm not seeing it from an observational standpoint and it's not being reported anymore. You notice you don't see those charts in the papers or in the headlines. These used, used to have those charts on us constantly. This much, being people affected, this the mortality, this much. Now you don't see those charts at all. All you see are the charts on the number of people vaccinated and unvaccinated. And every once in a while, you know, they'll throw a chart in there if it if it's, provides a selection bias in reference to presenting their argument. Like when Florida was higher in cases, now Florida's lower in cases. Is Florida in the news anymore? No, it's quietly pushed aside. All right, but that's where we get to that in a little bit. But let's go back to here, read the conclusion. Since Jackson reported problems with Ventavia to the FDA in September 2020, Pfizer has hired Ventavia as a research. This is, remember, this is a subcontract. Pfizer has hired Ventavia as a research subcontractor in four other vaccine trials. And parents out there, you'll love this. The COVID-19 vaccine in children and young adults, pregnant women, and the booster dose, as well as respiratory virus vaccine trial. 
The advisory committee for the Centers for Disease Control is set to discuss the COVID-19 pediatric trial vaccine on November 2nd. Now, again, you see that then that's when they approved it. Now, here's the problem. The article date, November 2nd. The vaccine date, we go down, November 2nd. What happened there? So all this day data comes out the same day as these get approved for children and everything else like that. You see the correlations that just do not sit well with me. If something was clean and the data was accurate and it was presented in a clear, concise matter, these things wouldn't look so shady. Now, shady is probably the wrong word because it's implying a causative relationship. But let's put it this way. If it's not being put in a position which alleviates all doubt. All right. Is that the best way I could say it? All right. So that's the article. I'll have the links for the article as well. Maybe we can get a little more traction on this and maybe get some uh, news art stations to actually do some research uh, besides uh, trying to, you know, incorporate that confounding in order to uh, rationalize their uh perception of their current reality. All right, next. Patient directory among hospitalized COVID-19 patients vaccinated with mRNA vaccine in Norway, a registered-based cohort. To begin, the results. We included 2,361 patients, including uh, partially vaccinated and fully vaccinated. See, not a large trial size between the groups. So that's why I want. I don't want to give it a, uh, something called a power rating. So it's not a big enough group in order to say, hey, this is the way it's supposed to be, but still. Fully vaccinated patients, 1879, had a shorter length of stay in the hospital overall. Now, now let's split hairs. Length of stay in the hospital. Now, when we were opened up that original data in the beginning, what were we looking at? Admission to ICU and mortality. Not length of stay in the hospital. So I'm not going to say anything past that point. But... It does obviously just by noticing length of stay, it's it doesn't really tell the whole story now, does it? Uh, hospital overall and lower odds of ICU admission. Maybe, maybe not. Let's look at that raw data again. Similar estimates were observed when collectively analyzing partially and fully vaccinated patients. We observed no difference in the length of stay for patients not admitted to ICU nor odds in hospital death between vaccinated and unvaccinated patients. So there's part of it. And the conclusion you can read through. But we're just going to look at the raw data. And the study will be there for us to look at just a well. And let's look at that raw data again. Here we go. Ready? Do, do, do. Again, data has to be analyzed in certain ways and so on and so forth. But let's just look at the raw numbers. Unvaccinated. We read this part. 18 to 64. Uh, yes means to go to ICU. 17%. Age uh 2% mortality compared to 20, 12 and a half. 65 to 79, 20 and a half percent unvaccinated with ICU uh, compared to 17%. All right. So there is a win for the fully vaccinated group if you want to keep score. Uh, mortality rate. Now it's a little different now, isn't it? 65 to 79, 10% mortality rate compared to 12. So Remember last week, we looked at that chart in reference to vaccines uh, limiting, uh, reducing death in the hospital. And this correlates with that study we looked at last week. So again, the drum beats on. 18 to 79, uh, admission to ICU. Look at a different uh, age group here. I don't know why they're going from there to there. They're just, saying, oh, they're just taking the whole thing. That's what they're doing. All right. So 19%, 18%. All right, the win for the fully vaccinated. Mortality, death in hospital, 3%, 12%. So, you know, the take home here is you're fully vaccinated. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to say anything because that's hitting publisher bias. And let's go. And greater than or equal to 80 years of age, that was hidden at the bottom there. Uh, if you are the mission to ICU, 6%. If you're unvaccinated, 7% uh, fully vaccinated, you're not a great selling point here. 
Uh, mortality in hospital there is less if you're uh, 80 or older. So you had 20% there and 12%. And then above or equal to 18 overall. You ready? Mortality in hospital, 4%. 12%. Fully vaccinated here. Unvaccinated here. Now here you got it. This is where they got the data unless ICU admissions. Ready? Right there it is. See, there it is. 18, 14. You see? So that's when they weighted everything together. Because they weighted it with obviously, you know, the groups which are favorable, which is the, um, which is, you know, generally the two, two, two right here. So 82. Yeah. So they weighted it with a higher group. So when they weighted it all together, greater than 18, yes, there was less of a likelihood of admission to ICU by four percentage points. But when you break it down into the majority age group, for example, let's say, uh, you know, let's say 18 to 64 would here, uh, 1720. So you see how you, you, you get that average up by, by changing the selection group. I'm not saying anything was wrong, but yeah, the group does determine the outcome. You see that. All right. To proceed as follows up. Oh, it's getting later. We're not even done yet. All right. So let's go to the next one. Let's see if I have any more. Here it is. In contrast, a study from Michigan, I want to see this study too. If anybody has links to the study, let's check it out. In contrast, a study from Michigan, United States, did not find lower odds of ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, or death when comparing 825 partially vaccinated or 129 fully vaccinated patients uh, with either one to unvaccinated patients. So I will reiterate that. In contrast, a study from Michigan, United States, did not find Lower odds of ICU admission, mechanical ventilation, or death when comparing 825 partially vaccinated or 129 fully vaccinated patients vaccinated with da 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 to unvaccinated patients. All right, see, that's why when I see studies like this and things along those lines, even though we're not really talking necessarily well, commonality, yet, the, the, you know, all the exact same vaccines, um, and they're saying the exact same thing that that more studies need to be done just to confirm. But when I see numbers that come up and I see this and I start seeing weird data as we saw right here, you know, you, you start it, again, it, it doesn't seem like a rock solid argument in reference to um, inoculation strategies. And it doesn't mean not no other inoculations. It just means the inoculation of the day. Uh, maybe there's a better one around the corner because this, there's just this, you don't have a rock solid, you know, argument to proceed as follows. Immunity to COVID-19 uh, in India through vaccination, natural infection. We'll just go to the uh, synopsis here. Ba -ba 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 -ba, it says the best and plus we're so limited on time. All right, here we go. However, our study also reveals that the immune response of vaccinated people is not quite to the same level as that of the naturally infected. A lot of healthcare workers are my friends. A lot have been on the front line and they've been exposed to basically a multitude of different illnesses, a variety, including including the one of the day. And they feel like, you know, if I have natural, if I was naturally infected, confirmed naturally infected, uh, then what the heck? Why are you doing this to me? You get the point. Whether COVID shield or Covaxin, the only talking about vaccines I was discussed in India, or a natural infection will generate enough long term immunity to cross the hurdle of future infections by the SARS CoV 2 wild type strain, or its mutant variants remain to, taint, remain to be seen. But, what they quote, however, our study also reveals that the immune response of vaccinated people is not quite to the same level of that of the naturally affected. That's an equal. And that's an equal. Not even quite to the same level. But again, the links will be there as follows. And I think that was probably, yeah, a lot of data on that one. But boom, next one. Cute, if it wasn't so serious, and uh, implications for economic viability, lockdowns, and being here in California which our state of emergency was literally declared because winter is coming. I think that was the quote. Surprised that one didn't make the news at all. 
But here we go. Here we go. Avoiding false positive of SARS. Yes. What I'm alluding to is again California state of emergency being extended to March, March or May 2022. I don't know. It just seems like forever at this point. All right. Uh, when using rapid antigen tests to proceed. Additionally, school children being tested for the virus were surreptitiously adding fruit juice and other contaminants into the test device to cause false positives in order to gain time off from school. And now people are going, well, that's awfully bad for them to do. Wouldn't they be? Obviously, some people have not been a kid long enough. The study's importance goes beyond combating the spread of falsehoods on social media. It could be a widespread benefit to the public health worldwide as the rapid antigen test in question has been distributed to more than 120 countries. And basically what he's saying is, oops. So they're saying we need to come up with a better test. But to proceed, the investigators performed rapid antigen tests for SARS-CoV-2 on various commercial beverages with differing salt content and pH levels. And to reiterate, these tests all resulted in false positives. All resulted in false positives. I'm so sad that basically this, you know, we do these videos and they, they max out at about 100 views. But, you know, the weight of the information that we are fortunate enough to review is so profound. And this as well is profound. But yet, you know, People continue going down the same path, regardless of that path being right or wrong. Following that, each component of the buffer solution was removed. In turn, the in absence of each invariably resulted in a false positive. A buffer is a solution that resists changes in pH when acid or alkali is added to it. Buffers typically comprise a weak acid or alkali together with one of its salts and a small organic compound called tricene. The buffer creates an environment that prevents the antibodies from binding to each other unless SARS-CoV-2 is present. Thus, the study found that emitting the manufactured buffer or altering in any way could generate false positives, highlighting the essential role of each of the buffer components for the proper test function. I will reiterate. The investigators performed a rapid antigen test for SARS-CoV-2 on various commercial beverages with different salt content to pH level, and they all resulted in false positives discovered first, most likely by school children that needed a day off or week off. And obviously that had repercussions quite dramatic throughout the rest of society and probably why California has a hard time going back to school because kids have fruit juices and they have a lot of paranoid instructors. Not all of them, some of them are very good, but you know, you get the drift. I'm not to bemoan our great teachers, but however though, they're you know, the ones that like to teach, but to proceed. All right, next after that, new study finds evidence of COVID-19, COVID antibodies in breast milk and vaccinated mothers. I'm only bringing this because something different is here. And these signals, they tend to they tend to start really small, and then they begin to add meaning as time moves forward. So those who follow these videos recognize a lot of things we started with were really small. In like, for example, the vaccine, you can't get breakthrough infections and so on and so forth. And then obviously it grows, and now breakthrough infections are not really even breakthrough infections anymore. It's almost an expectation. You're just saying, well, you won't be in the hospital as long. But to proceed, mothers who had disease-acquired immunity produce high levels of immunoglobulin, a, antibodies against the virus of breast, breast milk. While vaccine-acquired immunity produced robust immune globulin G antibodies. There's a difference. Previous studies from URMC had shown evidence of antibodies in breast milk from COVID-positive COVID mothers. The follow-up study represents the longest time period the disease-acquired antibodies have been examined post-illness. And the results show that these antibodies exist for three months after infection. For vaccinated mothers, the study found evidence of a mild to modest decline in antibodies on average three months post-infection. And I'll leave it at that. After that, associated, whoop, we did that one already in reference to long COVID and be cautious. It could be something else, just that people are defaulting to the immediate uh, disease of the day. After that, this is interesting. This has nothing to do with health or even a, a breach. Remember, I said in the beginning, credibility is a big thing and character is often is what defines what an individual does when no one is looking. So here we proceed. The NIH gave Moderna 1.4 billion to develop the vaccine and lent the company scientists and facilities. This is not an uncommon thing. 
And Anthony Fauci called it the NIH Moderna COVID-19 vaccine. So there was a vested interest in the NIH, obviously making sure the vaccine was favorable. But here's the kicker. Are you ready? So they think they're going to get patents from the NIH and everything else like that. And, you know, it's going to turn out well. Uh, not so fast. Moderna has turned its people's vaccine into a rich people's vaccine, refusing to share technology with the World Health Organization or developing country manufacturers and sharing very few doses with COVAX while overcharging poor nations. I mean, well, yeah, character is something when someone's not looking, but then there's also just basically, you know, there's this. Now let's read the front part. After Collins predict the legal action, Peter Nebart, Bartabuk? Uh, Director of Public Citizens Access to Medicine Program congratulated the government for showing a modicum of veer at the last suggesting will not allow federal scientists' role in the invention, what the heck, of the NIH Moderna vaccine to be erased. All right, so they're trying not to. But this is what Moderna wants to do. Are you ready? All along, recognize the substantial role that the NIH has played in developing Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine. But is legally bound to exclude the agency from the patent application because, quote, only Moderna scientists designed the sequence. And let's read the next thing. I think it's Moderna has made a serious mistake here in not providing the kind of co-inventorship credit to the people who played a major role in the development of the vaccine that they're now making a fair amount of money off of. It's not a good idea to file a patent when you leave out important inventors. And so this is going to be get sorted as people look harder at this. So initially, they, they said, quote, I did not expect this to outcome from what we have been a friendly collab collaborative effort between scientists at the NIH and Moderna over many years. And they just cut them out. So here it is the researchers do a great job in the discovery of the basically the vaccine and are actually part of you know, Moderna used the U.S. government lab. They use the researchers, they use facilities, so on and so forth. And then they just quietly erase all the participation of basically public officials. And in the meantime, gave, not lent, gave $1.4 billion. And this is the type of character which obviously does not reduce hesitancy, does it? Or should it? So basically, when you have breaches of character and trust, let's say, for example, in this case, Moderna, or in this case, a Pfizer, would that not raise red flags with anyone that maybe there needs to be an independent uh, group looking into this, per se, especially since now it's affecting children and so on and so forth, and that the outcome and the data that is in the wild, per, uh, the observational data that's been going on now for quite some time does not support uh, that the efficacy or the level in the real world uh, as promised when these received emergency use authorization uh, and then approval. But to proceed as follows after that, uh, yep, let's get into our data. All right, again, this is our basic various data set again. It's only reports two VARES, and let's make a brief run through real fast. Here we go. Do, do, do. Let's go to our first part, and let's go to our zip file size, right? We've been following this for a while, for those not familiar. Our zip file size. There we are. This is, give it a second here. There it goes. A VARES report zip file size comparison. This is the file size. Let's make this a little larger so people can see better. Here we are. This is all of, talk about overwhelmed. Uh, this is the CDC. These are all the reports filed to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System just from January 1st of this year to today. Uh, this actually, I think it was November 11th or somewhere around there. And this is the zip file size. That's 153 megabytes, for those not familiar, compared to 2020, all the way down to 1990. And if we look at the file size comparison, just those two files alone, there we are from 1990 to 2020, it's 122.53 megabytes. 
Let's remember, those who are not familiar, this is the you take all the reports coming in, this is the size. And now 153.03 megabytes from January to today. Uh, file size difference. We're now 30.5 megabytes larger than we are for the the for the prior three decades combined. Uh, percentage greater that equals out. That is two 24.89 percent greater of uh, number of reports, at least data wise, as opposed to the first three decades prior. All right, that gives you an idea of the amount of information that's coming in. And it's also why uh, a lot of my, the data I show you now runs a lot slower. In the beginning when we started doing this, you know, it wasn't that bad. But those not familiar, if we look at this right here, uh, just to confirm with you, so you get an idea. There's 2021. That's the zip file size looking at 153. Point, uh, make this a little bigger. 153 megabytes. That's the actual size after it's unzipped. So we're actually looking at a pretty much like downloading a modern video game. Uh, and there's 2020, 2021, so on and so forth. So you can see the file size is being so much smaller. So yeah, there's a lot uh, of why I have a little bit of hesitation, and I hope you understand why. All right, let's go to the US database real fast, VARES. Again, we'll look at the disclaimer again, give it a few seconds to come back up because the database is so huge. In reference to that, hang on, here we are. All right, this is VARES duplicated reports as of November 13, 2021. This is for our data analysts out here. 276,848 people experienced so many symptoms, so many symptoms that they had to file more than one report. And the reports are linked to IDs. So you have to take out duplicate IDs. So the reality is there's only 665,460 reports submitted to the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System, as we covered a little earlier. All right, move down. I'm going to scroll through these real fast because I really have a faster synopsis at the bottom. And I'll redo all this in a little bit. So it's a little easier to run through. All right, these are reports. Uh, Moderna is ranking up the number one uh, number of vaccine reports reported to VARES. And again, there's that. Mortality is reported to VARES, not reports from VARES. Keep on reiterating that. 8,440, and these are your age groups down the line. And before we started, there was nothing down here, and now you're starting to see some reports come up that way. Coming down the line, this is actually way too big now. This is all of the adverse event reports being submitted to the CDC VAERS system. That's 2020. That's 2021. That's all 2020. All of 2020. And this, of course, is only up to, we're not quite done with the year. All right. I'm going to go through this real fast. I'll redo those in a little clearer format later on. And I broke it up a little different now because I want to be able to line up the other uh, other reports globally. All right, let's make this a little smaller. We may bounce for a second. Let's see. No, we're not. Yeah, we did. All right, reports submitted. Uh, we had some safety signals in reference to narcolepsy. I'm not seeing a, narco, uh, a narcolepsy uh, indicator as of yet, but we're beginning to see it, and, and it's just... That's why I want to put fatigue there. It's 163,000 reports of fatigue. Uh, these are the breakthrough, and these are these are ones of interest. Now let's go to the reports overall. All right, reports submitted per condition. Uh, you can see that there. You see the numbers there, and this is the age. And this is where the myocarditis raises a big signal. And see 26.17. Now what I did is I took the the outliers out on the tails. And so that's why it's become a big concern uh, for a lot of researchers. Cause you look at the age there and it's, it's pretty much representative of uh, could be background. And all of a sudden you see this here. Now the question they have is, is myocarditis just as high in those infected with COVID on its own or higher? Uh, but it's not, that's not holding weight as of yet. So I'm just trying to say it looks, that's, that's a red flag. All right, let's proceed. Most common symptoms, 
uh, vaccine adverse event reports. Uh, look at headache, paroxysmal fatigue, chills, pain, dizziness, nausea. These are the most common. Now, remember, keep in mind too, one person may have multiple symptoms, and so you're seeing the reports now from the symptom column and not from the symptom text. So I want you to keep that, make that aware, and I'll explain maybe that a little bit later on when we have more time. So this is from the symptom column, not from the symptom text. These are symptoms which are not as common, fairly common, but not the number one, peripheral swelling, vaccination site pain, just discomfort, a product administered to patient of inappropriate age. That's like a lot of them. Uh, loss of consciousness, next pain, injection site, and so on and so forth. So these are the ones that are not as common. Uh, you know, and the reason you're seeing a, a lower count for death is because there's a column that says death and they'll hit like Y and they won't put any symptoms in there. So we're only going from this, the symptom one, two, three from the various system and not just basically just uh, being registered as passed on or disabled. And those that know the columns will understand what I'm talking about. We're not going from, this is not going from the Boolean Y, which is on the reports. We're just going from the, the symptoms. And sometimes not all of the death is recorded in the symptom one, two, three, four, five. All right, and then we go here, uncommon. Uh, Tavares, these are the ones that may not be uh, unresponsive to stimuli. Uh, you can go down here, loss of personal independence and daily activities. Uh, these are the ones which are being reported to unvaluable event, which obviously no cue, clue, uh, clue. Uh, that are even more, a little more disturbing, but some of them are not like vac vaccination site swelling, impaired workability, and so on and so forth. And then we go to the, I should put rare, rare, this should not just be in common. Yeah. Uh, these are the ones which I want to keep an eye out for too. Taste disorders, gait inability. These can be, you know, a lot of weird things, but there's still pain of skin. Uh, you know, interesting, uh, but that are out there. And then here's a really rare. Uh, some of these are basically diagnosis, skin burning sensation. Uh, you get down the line there. I don't want to get into basically the, the obscure. Uh, but that's some of the really rare ones being reported. All right, this is the uh, the individuals which reportedly were disabled by the vaccine, reported to, various has to confirm. Uh, right here is your age, if you could read that. And the median age for people claiming disability from the vaccine to VAERS is 55, uh, but there's your age groups. Uh, mortality. Uh, Look, see the median right there is 75. Some poor individual of 106, but you see down the line there. Uh, as far as the box plot, going down, violin plot, uh, vaccine reaction reports. I guess there's a person of 119 years of age. Uh, that basically, that, I don't know if that's basically a mistype in the report. Maybe they meant 19 and added an additional one, but we could verify that later on. Uh, but the most common reactions, and you have like a small extra boost here down the bottom there, uh, being reported in reference to the average age of the individual reporting a reaction to VARES. And let's go to the next one. Uh, we looked at this, we looked at COVID. Let's say, for example, do I have anything at the top here? The rebuild. Let's see. We looked at Florida already real fast. Here we are. This is the average age of mortality right now. They're looking at, no, uh, at right here. And to give you a little more of a breakdown into a, uh, uh, basically a, um, it's almost like, I wanna say bubble. But here we are, age mortality breakdown as far as uh, the scatter plot here. I wanna say bubble chart, but it's, it's yeah, it looks like a bubble to me, but it's scatter. All right, and there we are, zero to 17 has been, according to the CDC, it has been 595. Um, more, you know, poor souls that have passed on, uh, basically in reference to COVID, uh, then going down the line, uh, you see the age groups, 
This all this is cumulative, not just from January this year, but this is the since the entire pandemic. And that's uh, 85 or older uh, is still the largest group succumbing to COVID-19. I put this here because average age in the United States is 76. Uh, I, you know, as far as an average age, that'd be really a, a, a weird, weird country. Life expectancy, average life expectancy. All right, to proceed. And we went to this one already. So I showed you Florida, showed you the um, the mortality reference to the, um, uh, the other charts per se uh, down the line. But again, for expediency, you know, how basic your mortality has not really changed that much with all these inoculations. And everyone was unvaccinated here. Everyone was unvaccinated here. There was no vaccine by July 2020. And, you know, it may be a little bit better there. I don't know, but I need to see a correlation. And I'm not seeing it. And so, da da da. Yeah, all I see, for example, here is a traditional pattern, and this is all the states combined. Now, one seems to step out. All right, then after that, mutations. Last week, I did not cover mutations. I forgot about it, passed on, because, like, what? It's 12.40 right now, but look, check this out. Ready this? Well, let's go to the front real top real fast. Hang on. Let's see, make sure I'm not missing anything. Nope, not missing anything. All right, we'll skip over that. This one always amazed me. This is people fully vaccinated per 100. This is total cases per million. Blue is the total cases per million. Red is the people uh, fully vaccinated. The correlation is 0.922121. For those that understand correlation, a correlation of 0.922121, and correlation is not causation, but a 0.922121, for those familiar with that statistic, you tell me, is that bizarre or what? All right, and then we go down the line. Da, da, da. Let's skip over all this for expediency. Da, 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 da. And this is correlation. Again, a big person observation. How are the vaccines working in the wild? Let's get let's give some uh, let's look at our observations. You ready? I'm gonna go through all this. Here we go. Total cases per million. Remember this right, number right here? That's 71 to 100 people being vaccinated per hundred. So right here, and so zero to 10 people fully vaccinated per hundred. This is fully vaccinated mean. That's the total cases per million. These are 71 to 100 people fully. Well, I think, what is it? It's like only um, just going real down real fast. There are some countries right now, for example, like the United Arab Emirates, uh, which is now being in Portugal and Singapore and Chile uh, for 81 out of 100 people being fully vaccinated uh, per 100. That's So there are people with those numbers. Let's go back up real fast. Uh, new deaths per million. Zero to 10 people fully vaccinated per 100 compared to 71 to 100. You sh you got you have to start seeing me. So if you want to convince me in the argument, the reference to basically everything's hunky dory with the inoculation world, uh, I need to see some correlations. At least give me at least give me something. A reproduction rate. Well, the reproduction rate's a little higher now in the zero ten. I have no clue what that drop is there. Uh, but that's seventy one to one hundred. That's zero to ten. New cases smooth per million. Oh wow, we went off the x-axis here. So we're at 200. Wow, that's 200. I, let's let me see when they're all fast. Hang on, I gotta find out where this is at. That's a dun da da. Let's see, can I change the axis here? Where is my axis? Well, I'm not gonna mess with it too much because I can't find my axis here. But yeah, there it is, right there. All right, hang on. We're going to check it out real fast. We got to raise the axis up to see exactly where we're at. So let's see if this pops up real fast. If we're fortunate enough, there we are. Let's look at it again. There we are. New cases smooth per million. Countries which are vaccinated to a 71 to 100. Well, I hope you all are still hanging on to see that. Um, two basically countries zero to 10, 11. It's like maybe they just don't count anymore. You know what I mean? Maybe that's the, that's the confounding factor. But for those most vaccinated, have the most cases per million. All right. And this is our bubble plot. Fully vaccinated per 100 to new cases per million. For those who want to see. Austria. Belgium. Um, they're all on the top line. Here's the case to the countries which are not fully vaccinated or low. 
booster shots. We'll skip real fast for time expediency. Uh, ba -ba -bom. And we'll skip this scatter plot. For example, if you wanted to, this is just trying to find correlations. But I'll show you an interesting one real fast. Let's look at Singapore. Ready? And let's see. There we are. Oops. Come on, Singapore. Check this out. Now, let's see where are we looking at new deaths. Uh, positivity rate, people fully vaccinated. People, look, the positivity rate was just like skyrocketing. And you you can get an idea. It, it's basically, there. that's that's the part that you see right there. That's what I was looking for. The positivity rate, can we uh, make this larger? Let's see. Let's see if we can bring this into play. Just all of a sudden just skyrocketed. And it's not going to come up, but don't worry about that right now. I just want to see if I can make it larger, but not yet. But look at that. Hang on one second. Let's pause this real fast. Yeah, I just found that correlation so bizarre that the positivity rate just went like skyrocket out of nowhere. All right, these people, these are the, the countries, obviously, and their vaccination per 100. And these are the countries which are hardly vaccinated. And let's see. Oh, here we go. I'm going to pass over this real fast because uh, I want to get to the um, the variants. This is reports as of the 12th of uh, November 2021. And obviously now it's the 14th of November. And it's good morning, 12.53 a.m. There's our variant Delta. Soon we'll get a new uh, variant coming up there, uh, which would be the sub-Delta or Delta whatever. And then the only other variant that's popping up there is still Alpha, a little bit in Cambodia. Um, nothing really new as opposed to the other variants, which we go back and you can see how it, it was a battle for which variant was going to win over time. And I think that's it for that one. Let's go to the web. Let's go to our European database. And let's see what we got here. All right, we have... 496,798 serious events reported to endure vigilance. Now, keep in mind, serious in their definition is one that requires medical attention. All right? And I believe, I mean, Jansen's still out there, but not a lot, but still just the same. That's cumulative. Cumulative over time. There we are. We have 1,163,956 reports now being submitted to endure vigilance. Uh, and again, being the highest number doesn't mean it's the most dangerous because we have to look at as a percentage of the number of vaccines being administered. And there's still Janssen being administered. There's like, I looked at it, there was like a couple of, um, it was like there's a thousand shots out there somewhere, but it went up and so on and so forth. Most common number. Fatal designation is tough because I have to be able to weed through this because even though it says 17,965, a fatal designation, remember we said can we have two, two reports, symptom reports, the way your vigilance works, can be linked to the same person. So, for example, if headache and chills are on there, headache, they'll have a fatal designation, chills have a fatal designation, which will give you a, a false a high on the number of designations. So after we do that to find out what exactly it is, um, and so on and so forth. Now we've got past the word clouds, we want to eliminate those. And then the serious reports as of November 13, 2021, which I want to get this to harmonize with our database. But here we are. Uh, that's weird. I didn't see that last time. Uh, again, all because you see something like that doesn't mean it's there that look at background rates, but they're saying it's spontaneous when they get vaccinated and that occurs, that's, that's, we'll start checking our database as well. The my, myocarditis, uh, Bell's palsy. Remember there's so much, they administered uh, almost, you know, twice as many uh, vaccines as we have. And so it does skew a little bit, but I will get it to a line and I'll combine the databases together, the Dura Vigilance and ours, uh, the VARES, so we can get a global look uh, to look for safety signals on our own since it doesn't really appear that anyone else is doing it. You know what I mean? All right, and to proceed, let's see down the line. And I think that is it. 
And the Twitter, I'm not doing the Twitter anymore because sentiment analysis wise, um, if you're censoring and kicking off people off of Twitter uh, due to basically not having a, not contributing to your harmonious environment, then data mining uh, from a social media site is, is superfluous. Because it's not giving you a solid rec reflection of the true sentiment of the individuals out there. If you're getting rid of all the people whose sentiment that you don't like, then data mining from that database, whether regardless of the social media platform, is is practically useless because it's not going to give you a solid reflection of the attitude in the general populace. All right, let's begin. We looked at that. We looked at the databases. Going backwards. All right, Moderna. Doesn't want to give up or give anybody any credit for helping invent the vaccine from the government and the money as well. Um, long COVID-19, be careful, may be something else. A lot of people claim to have long COVID-19, never really had a laboratory confirmed COVID-19 infection. All right, and then after that, uh, SARS antibodies, at least in human breast milk, different. Why? We'll find out. False positives, kids, fruit juice, getting out of school, too easy. All right, immunity to um, COVID-19, nat uh, natural immunity. Uh, I know the argument is out there. They say no, but studies pretty much say natural immunity is better. All right, patient trajectory. Um, this is a Norwegian study. Um, yeah, uh, can't really add more to that. Uh, the raw data, as a per se, needs to be validated once again. But again, when I see data like this, it makes you wonder about stories like this. Um, let's get this story some traction again. That on the day that the person, think about it, on the day the person submitted the FD, the complaint, they got terminated. And the day that the article came out from the British Medical Journal in reference to this action, the, um, you know, they, they recommend the booster shots and everything else for kids. All right, nothing wrong with that whatsoever. All right, here's that, anticoagulant, heparin, showing a lot of promise. I'd like to see a lot more traction as opposed to the other uh, well-named medications that are out there. Um, mushrooms, uh, agaricon and turkey tail, real promising, 50-50 blend. And this formula, which I would love to pronounce, I'll give it a shot, but I haven't heard it yet, so I don't want to be disrespectful. Shows possible great promise, and it is in trials. And then, oh, carrageenan, this nasal spray, incredible formula. Uh, Gelin, Gelin, and carrageenan uh, from Irish moss, lambda form of carrageenan, you know, per se. So it doesn't do that uh, gelling stuff. And looks very, very promising. If it holds up to its lab studies in human trials, that will definitely kick butt. Again, Ralph signing off. Catch you all once again next week. When it when it renders to 4K, then I'll bookmark in a chapter for all you all. And I'm just glad the computer didn't crash. And I'm glad if you're listening this long. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I'll catch you all next time. See you then. Bye.